Hi there. Today we are over in North Yorkshire and we are interviewing uh, Craig Hall of CarPro UK. Hi Bert. Um, and I thought it'd be nice to have a little catch up. Craig's been in the industry for a very, very long time. Uh, when did you start getting into detail? Uh, 2007. And so it's 11 years now. 11 years. And so you were what, 12 then? Or? <laughs> I would have been 17. 17, quite yeah. And that was, or was that hands on stuff or was that from a product side? It was when I first got my first car, I started getting a kind of home level detailing mm -hmm. and after about a year I uh, started doing it part time and at that time I was still a chef and then from there I got a job for another coating manufacturer and I went down there to be their, their head detailer down in Hemel mm -hmm. uh, and then from there it kind of led on to doing full time detailing and then I didn't start the, the product stuff until four years ago. Gotcha. Um, how did you cope in Hemel as a Scotsman? Just had to keep repeating myself all day. Mm -hmm. So every time you speak to someone, you tell them it four times. Yes, uh, that's absolutely right. We will be subtitling this, so don't <laughs> worry. Um, and so when, you, when did you take on CarPro UK? So I took on CarPro UK on the 1st of November, 2013. At that time, I was the Seaquart's finest de detailer for Edinburgh. Uh, so it was, uh, I already knew the product range. I'd been doing the, this, I'd been in Edinburgh for about a year as the Seaquart's finest detailer. Mm -hmm. So I knew the products well. I knew the coatings, so it was a pretty natural progression just to go into the sales side. I still done detailing for a couple of months and then we kind of closed that down and focused mainly on Carpro right. UK. So you're the lo longest incumbent in the UK. Yeah. Um, I must apologise, I've got a bit of cold at the moment, so I'm sounding very gravelly and a little bit sexy. Um, what I was uh, wanting to ask about really was about the coating industry because uh, when we talk, for example, to Car, uh, not to Carpro, to CarCam, uh -huh. um, they were just sort of getting in on the scene. Uh, about the ceramic coatings, but really CarPro is almost defined, although they do lots of other products, uh, things like Pearl, for example, done very well in Megatest in the past, and we're putting your leather products to test as it happens at, yep. at this very moment. I'm, I'm confident. You're confident? Well, you've been asking me lots of questions, I've been keeping yeah. completely tight-lipped, but um, <laughs> they haven't done badly, um, from what I know. Um, but the, um, from a ceramic point of view, that's kind of defines CarPro. CarPro is, is yeah. very much a, a ceramic so specialist. So CarPro started as a company called A-Quartz, uh, and A-Quartz done a hydrophilic coating. And it lasted for about two years, but they very quickly realised that hydrophilic means it doesn't bead. Yes. And in the UK and in the American markets, which is their main markets, people expect their protection to bead up. So they, they, were, used to, yeah. they were used to waxes and stuff, and the oils make it hydrophobic. So you know a, a wax has started to fade off because it goes hydrophilic and it starts to sheet water instead. So when people were putting a coating on and they were finding out it was hydrophilic, they were thinking the coating doesn't work. So from there, they changed to sea quartz when they brought out their hydrophobic range. Uh, that was before we had any maintenance products at all. Back then, we used to tell people just to use any non-wax shampoo mm -hmm. uh, and just maintain it. Eventually, the first liquid product that came out, I think, was Reload. So was all, the, all, all your all liquid, all the ancillary products have come out as a consequence of wanting yes. to look after the cars that are coated with your yeah, product. Yeah, so the main focus was the sea quartz range. That was. CarPro at that time, we didn't use the name CarPro. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just Seacorps, that's why Avi's website is still Seacorps.com. Oh, all of the branding is just Seacorps, uh, isn't it? Yeah. So okay. all, the cotton range, all the cotton range, we've always stuck to the Seacorps name because it's the longest kind of name we've stood and used. Yeah. So the CarPro side of the business has became just, it came about just to bring out a maintenance range mm -hmm. and able to keep the coatings performing at the top of their kind of game. Uh, so even the, the original Iron X was called A Quartz Iron Cut, right? Uh, and it was the very first ever colour change and fallout remover. Oh, so, you, so you're laying the claim to be the first, the so first great of bleeding fallout remover? It was it, certainly the first uh, bleeding fallout remover in the detailing scene. Yeah. Uh, so it's called Iron Cut, and if you think Iron X smells bad now, <laughs> you should nip into Gordon Muir's. He still has the original sample of A Quartz Iron Cut, and it could quite clear it could clear uh, an entire car meat. Oh, so it's quite useful stuff then. Which is, yes. <laughs> it's um, uh, when the party's going too hard and you want rid of everyone. <laughs> just scattering it around. Yeah. Oh, one little spray in the room. <laughs> that's, cool. that's cool. Um, and so, um, in the market, since, since Carpro has been around, since you've been around, so to speak, there's been an explosion of yeah. other um, different ceramic options. Now, some of these are genuinely unique, they're generally developed. Uh -huh. I mean, because Carpro's Korean, isn't it? Is yeah, that's so what the fact is. All bar one of our products is made in Korea. Yeah. Uh, one of them is made in Japan because it, we don't have the technology in Korea to make that. Uh, and it's, there's no one else in, this is Seaport's finest reserve. No one else in the world has an epoxy hybrid silica resin coating. Um, oh, hang on, so an epoxy? So it's, it's a, an epoxy hybrid with silica in the, the epoxy particles. Right. Uh, so it's essentially a whole new technology to the market. Uh, so with that one, 
there was no one else in the world that has that. The only, the only place that could manufacture it was in Japan, mm -hmm. so it's the only one that's not made in Korea. And that's your, your Rolls Royce one. So that's going up against things like G Technic Ultra, for yep. top ones, top end one. Uh, IGL do Kenzo, which is a two part. Yep. Now, um, we're at uh, Manor Classic Cars at the moment, and um, we've been coating a very sexy TBR Cerberus Speed 12 race car yep. um, with Max Car Care and Nick Fisher. So and the video of that will come out maybe in a month or so. Yeah, well, well when this video comes out, it probably will have already come out okay. um, the way things are. But um, the uh, car, I mean, Nick's, he's a TBR head, he's been getting very yeah, excited. Nick's, Nick's uh, very TBR obsessed. Yeah, we've had to restrain him a couple of times. He's asked for some time on his own with a car with the door shut, stuff like that. We don't want to go into the details, but we do have footage. Um, and um, anyway, so we, as I say, we're at Manor Classic Cars and there's this lovely collection of cars, including this gorgeous Alpha behind us. Um, but we have been putting on this new C Corps top of the range one. Yep. And one thing was interesting is you put two layers on, um, but with, say, uh, IGL Kenzo, you've got a base layer and then you've got a top layer. Yep. With yourself, you use two layers of the same stuff. And then we've been putting a relatively new product called Gliss on top of it, which is again equivalent to G Technic XO V3, yeah. apparently. Yeah, so the C Corps finest reserve. It is totally hydrophobic on its own, it doesn't need a coating topper. Mm -hmm. So the reason we're putting Gliss on this specific car is that Gliss offers a super slick surface and because this specific car is going back into Lakeland Motor Museum, they're going to be dusting the car down and it's not going to be washed properly. So the slickness is going to aid in just wiping the dust away without it digging into the paintwork, so it's going to reduce the marring. Gotcha. When you say slick, I, there are lots of phrases that I, I find detailers and manufacturers use. Uh -huh. So that, you know, as new car shine and gloss and all of these different things. Now, some of them are barely understandable, but slick, how would you specifically define slickness as opposed to, say, gloss? So as opposed to gloss, the slickness is going to be uh, in the, the way that the, the dirt or the dust slips over the surface. Okay, so it's a frictional coefficient? Yeah, it? so it's, it's based on the friction of it. So there's a, if you look back to our SEMA videos, there's a really good video we've done with the bonnet where we showed you the gliss bottle sitting on the bonnet and it's a very low angle, it's around I six degrees. We, we will link on this video to that video. And I, you can see yeah. as soon as you sit it on the, the gliss coated panel, it just goes, it slides off. Uh, so, so really what you're saying is gloss is a visual thing, so it's about yeah. light refraction, whereas slickness is a, is a physical property, it's a, a, a friction. So property. a really popular coating test that you'll see these days is people hitting it with a plastic lighter. Yes, it's bizarre and you, it's very difficult so, to tell it is a plastic lighter. You just see people aggressively going like this against cars and I'm just thinking this is slightly sac sacrilegious. So um, it's not something you ever want to do no but it's uh, a customer's going to look at that and they'll, they'll think the coating's super hard but that's really a test of slickness so gliss has absolutely no hardness in it but if you've done it if you've done that test you notice that the, the lighter doesn't leave a mark and the reason for that is that the the plastic's just skipping over the surface okay so we did do it a couple of times at SEMA but we didn't video it because we, we don't really like the test uh, no. it's it's kind of it's quite aggressive isn't it? we also don't want customers to think that they should do it yep uh, so it, it's it's even our reload product will perform just as well in the test. Uh, so it's a, it's a case of slickness rather than the hardness of the coating. Yes. So when you look at a coating, you want a coating to protect the paintwork from uh, chemical attacks, uh, anything abrasion resistance, and a big selling point of ceramic coating is marring resistance. Yeah, now this is, this is a hot topic because we uh, at PVD quite often get situations where somebody's coated a car and the customer's gone away and thinking, right, my car has now got a bulletproof layer. Um, and in extreme situations, we have had ones that have technically had car accidents and the customer's moaning that the car is damaged as a consequence of hitting a wall when the ceramic coating should have covered it. Um, now they're very special, very special customers, but even fairly normal down to earth people, if they look at some of the promotion around ceramic coatings per se, get the impression, I mean, I've, for example, uh, the G Tech ads, like, they do really cool visual adverts and stuff, and I think there's one with a lion or something standing on top of a car. Um, and I sit there and I think, crikey, well, it'd be really difficult to put a lion on top of a car for a start. Um, if very cool, but in terms of the amount of protection that it gives, um, 9H hardness, for example, or 8H or 7H, could you explain the difference between the MOHS scale and the pencil lead scale? So, a lot of people see 9H and they think it's, uh, it makes it as hard as diamond, because diamond's obviously 10H, and they think the only thing harder than this coating is now diamond. Uh, and at that point, they're confusing the mineral hardness scale with the pencil hardness scale. So, the pencil hardness scale is a, a test using uh, a, a basically an automatic machine and you've heard of, like you, in school you've used HB pencils, yeah. you then get 1H, 2H, 3H, all the way up to 9H. So these are made by Mitsubishi and it's a, a test for clear coat. And it's a test for abrasion resistance and when you, they develop a new clear coat, such as PPG or any other clear coat company, mm -hmm. other companies are available. <laughs> uh, 
they'll put it through the pencil test uh, and it has to reach a certain level to be allowed to be used for cars. Uh, and essentially all they're looking for is when they drag the pencil over it, if it marks or not. If you get a 9H certificate, it means that the, the 9H pencil marked it because 9H would mark 9H. Right. Uh, now the issue with these tests for coatings is that if car paint, quite typically they're used on silica discs. Now silica starts at 7H on the pencil hardness scale. Uh, on the mineral scale, silica starts around 3H. Yeah. So the difference between mineral and the, the pencil hardness test Mineral hardness is only used for uh, natural minerals, so your quartz, silicas, uh, diamonds, carbon. Whereas in terms of the pencil test, it's a much it's used on much softer items. So the likes of a silica disc is only going to perform to 7H on a pencil hardness test, and it reaches about 3H on the mineral hardness. So silica is a natural mineral. It's found in sand. Uh, it's found anywhere in the world, kind of thing. If you pick up sand on the beach, that's essentially what's in your ceramic coating. And that's that's silica SI is the unit and then every says SiO2 because yeah. silica dioxide is how it how Yeah, it so silica is. dioxide is how they process the silica and able to make it into something that you can dissolve into a solvent and then when the solvent dries off it cross links, creates a bond and it creates essentially a sheet of softened silica. So when you think of a ceramic coating people say uh, silica is a 3H on the mineral hardness scale but because you're basically diluting it with the solvent, even when it's bonded and fully cured, you're never even going to reach that 3H on a mineral scale. So when they do a pencil hardness test, it's typically on that silica disc already, so it's, it's sitting at 7H. So if you then put a couple layers of coating on top of that, the slickness or the hardness is going to create a, a friction coefficient with the pencil. So if the pencil can skip along, it's going to increase your H rating without actually having to increase the hardness, so the slickness does play a part in the test as well. So what you're saying is all these figures about 9H, 10H, a million H, they're actually not necessarily particularly useful in the real world. In the real world, your paint, your car paint is never going to be 7H. Even the, the actual, the hardest of sort of Mercedes ceramic lacquers and stuff like that, you'd be lucky if they'll make 7H, they'll probably get between six and seven. Something like a Ford uh, that's got a little bit softer paint or especially your Japanese cars like your Subaru. Like the good ones, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're probably on the kind of 3 to 4H range. So if you were to put a coating on top of them, it will increase the H range, but all of ours, we, we tell the customer it's going to increase it by 2H. So we won't sell you a 9H coating because we could put it on a silica disc and tell you it's a 9H, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be 9H when it goes onto your car's paintwork. So if you put it on your Subaru, you, you might get 4 or 5H, but if you're Using a BMW, for example, it's already starting at about five, then you'll get about seven. So, so that's interesting. So, the way of marketing it is instead of being a fixed number, it's a plus a fixed yeah. value, in this case, two age. Yeah, so it, it, then you can give the customer a lot better understanding of what they're actually getting rather than giving them a figure that they think they're getting, and then that way your customer's not disappointed when, it, when it's not getting what they were promised. Gotcha. So, we always like to under promise and over deliver. So, the likes of our top range Seaports Finest Reserve. We give a, a three year warranty on that, despite the fact that all the laboratory tests, it, because it was a brand new technology, it, you can't do a five to seven year uh, test in, test in, in the real time. world. Yeah. By that point, the technology would be <laughs> defunct. Yeah. So the laboratory tests that were done said that it is a five to seven year coating, but you can't perform a real world test in a laboratory. So we give a three year warranty and tell the customer it's going to last three years. When it lasts four or five, the customer thinks, brilliant, I basically yeah. got bonus time. But it's like you buy a super comes with the two, you warranty it will last for 50 years, you're like, this is amazing. So if we then were to sell the customer that with a seven year warranty, because the laboratory says it will last seven and it, it's gone in five years, it then looks bad on us because the yeah. customer thinks they told me it's a seven year coating. Well also these warranties, because there are companies out there offering seven year warranty. Uh, seven year so warranties. I think right now they go up to about nine years. Nine years is that. Uh, or there is a lifetime. Uh, but, but it was interesting because how many people who spend that sort of money on that sort of car will keep the car for yes. that length of time is one question. So how, how do you prove They're often not right? transferable. Yeah. Uh, and what even warranties when you break them down, they typically only cover manufacturing defects. Uh, and in, in most cases, if a coating fails, it will be down to the abrasion of the coating. The customer, if the customer isn't maintaining it properly, you can. Quite important is your pre-wash stage. You want to get all the dirt off the car before you start touching it. Because if you're abrading dirt in, it's like sand in the clear coat. Eventually you're going to abrade through that coating. You've got about 30 microns of clear coat on an average car. Mm -hmm. You have about one to four microns depending on the coating you're using. So it's quite, you can quite easily abrade through that. 
So that's when we come back to the part you were saying about people thinking the coating's bulletproof. Uh, you still need to maintain it properly. Yeah. Uh, that's why we recommend at least a six months, every six months, using IronX and Tarex to decontaminate the coating. And that'll just draw out any iron filings, take off any tar spots, and it'll return the coating back to how it was when it was applied. Uh, that way, when you're washing it, it's going to release the dirt a lot easier. Yeah. Because if you're not releasing the dirt in the pre-wash stage, you're then grinding it into the surface. Absolutely. Well, one interesting thing is you're, you're talking about the relative thicknesses. So about 30 microns um, of lacquer or clear coat and about one to four microns of coating. Yeah. Um, it was a point I was talking to Dom, Dodo Juice, in fact, uh -huh. who says, well, the next stage, the thing is, if we get too much further in, in the whole uh, development of ceramic coatings, it becomes equivalently just like putting another layer of lacquer in your car and why not do that? So in terms of another layer of lacquer, we can actually offer you that. We've got Carpro Mortal. Right. And Immortal is a self-healing clear coat. So people look at Carpro and they think it's all coatings. Immortal, well, they'll, they'll see Immortal and they'll think it's a self-healing coating. But Immortal is as close to a clear coat as you can get. And that's sprayed on, isn't it? It's sprayed on. So it is a 30 micron thickness as well. So it's sprayed on two layers of Immortal. Uh, and it's only th available through our approved body shops. Right now, uh, the number one approved body shop in the UK is Nick White at SL Restoration. Yep. Uh, and if you go to Nick, he can provide uh, Immortal. And would you put that on top of an existing car with clear coat, or would it be when you so pre-spray the car and you want to put... It would go back on top of the existing clear coat. So essentially, you've still got your clear coat there. Uh, due to the way that clear coats work, they tend to age. So the Immortal product will last around 7 to 10 years of self-heal. Right. Although it's permanent, just like any other clear coat, after 7 to 10 years, it'll start to harden and then it won't heal. And what's the difference between that? Because I know, sorry, I'm bugging up again here now, so I've got even more nasal. Um, the, um, the people like Infinity, this ad underneath, uh, they have uh, bought out self-healing clear yep. coats. Is that related to Immortal at all? So they're very similar. Uh, the, what we have that they don't is that ours will self-heal even down to, down to freezing. So with the Infinity, uh, you have to heat it to around 60 centigrade in order to self-heal. So you can put the car back in an oven and bake it. Uh, but ours will self-heal in real time right in front of you. Uh, so there is videos on YouTube as well of that, uh, yeah. at about 12 degrees, with a brass brush, uh, kind of swiping into it, uh, and you'll see it just heals immediately. Wow, wow, that's impressive stuff. Um, and because I know some of our guys have had infinities in to polish, um, yeah. and when you've got a self-healing clear coat, it gets terribly exciting if you're trying to yeah, polish that. I mean, so, is there uh, a point, should you try and polish that? How, how does it work? If you've got swell marks in your infinity, do you just find a really big oven, or can you use a detailer? So the problem with Infinity is uh, when you heat it, it's essentially resetting the memory. So I know there's guys in the USA in the really hot climates who have had issues where they've polished an Infinity. It's been perfectly fine, looks brilliant in the unit. It goes back out, uh, it gets heated up and the, the swirls reappear. And that's because it's reset to the memory, but it's, it's new memory is it's swirled, it's got a mark in it. That's very so clever. The you idea can, of a clear coat having a memory. I mean, it's not like a digital chip or anything. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's so it's, uh, it's essentially just when it heats up, the ions are attracted to themselves again. So it basically pulls back in. It's kind of like a facelift. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how it works. But it also has downsides of when the detailer's polishing it, it's reflowed. So it looks perfect. But then when it heats again, any marks that were too deep to repair means it'll open back up. Uh, just FYI, reflow is a phrase used by detailers and it literally means, well, how would you define your best place person here to define? So, reflowing is when you heat the lacquer and it, it swells. So, if, if it's a, a non, if it's just a normal lacquer and not one that self heals, uh, some, some detailers will call it bloom, some detailers will call it swell. Essentially what happens, at a point when lacquer gets too hot, it'll start to swell up. So it can, you can, this is a lot of detailers that have found they've heavy cut a car. Yeah. They'll go back in the next day and they'll find new marks that they didn't see that they thought they had removed. And the reason for that is overnight the paint's cooled back down, it's contracted. Yeah. So then the, the, the mark becomes visible again. Uh, so at that point, when you are heavy cutting a car, you do want to try and keep the heat down below a certain point. And that's a big thing with the uh, long throw DAs that come in. In the old days it was rotary only. Yeah, so rotary will pad to make a lot of heat. Yes. So the certain pads, like the microfiber system and stuff, they are designed to reduce the heat, uh, as well as the DA action because of the way it oscillates, it's, going to, it's not creating as much friction, so it's going to reduce the heat buildup. The only issue with long throw DAs is that they do cut faster than a rotary, so you could be removing more paint than you need to. Right. So if your micron's only kind of two to three microns, uh, if your damage is only two to three microns deep, 
but that long throw DA with whatever compound you're using might remove four or five. It, it lacks a little bit of the finesse of the rotary and the other issue is getting up to edges. Something we noticed on the Cerebra Speed 12, there's so much angles. Uh, DAs tend to struggle with concave curves. So as soon as you hit a concave, it just stops. Well, I saw you using a, a Roots LHR15 Mark II. Yep. You're using a Autobright Direct Dash 3, I saw at some point. Yep, the DA3 was out. We also had the Flex 14... Uh, P40 thing. P14, yeah. whatever they call it. The, the, the Rotary. The Rotary, yeah, uh, as opposed and to the And then we had the yeah. Festo Wrap 150, the Festo Wrap 80 for the 3-inch pad. Uh, and we had the Bigfoot Duetto out as well, the 12mm DA. So there's a lot of machines, and although I think a couple of them um, you had so many partly because there are two, two people working yeah. at once, and obviously you can't just have one watching, uh, that would be weird. Um, but at the same time, all of these machines were used for their special skills, so to speak. Yeah, so there is crossover between the two rotaries, but that is the only two that cross over. So the Flex PE14 and the Festo Wrap 150, they're, ident they're almost identical machines comes down to the ergonomics and the, the customer's preference. Uh, all, the other, all the other machines are completely separate. So the RAP80 is a, a three inch rotary. So we use that for the pre precision of being able to get right up to the edges without having to worry about the, the DA3 has a 12 mil throw. Right, yeah. So you can't get right up to the edge or it's kind of missing parts. Uh, and on the, especially on the curves of that speed 12, yes. it, it's only useful on flat panels. So that's when the rotary tends to come out, uh, just to make sure that you're getting full correction right up to an edge. That car looked like really hard work. I mean, you, certainly you would never be able to use a 21 on that because of the, the every single panel. Yeah, I think one, you, if you got the 21 out, you could probably do the roof panel yeah. and that's about it. And even that, the roof has a lip on it, yeah. so you can't get right to the edge of it, which is, uh, we found that as soon as we started using the 15, there was about a half inch along this lip that we couldn't polish. So that's why it, it, the 15 didn't get too much use on this. It tends to be just the tops of the wings uh, and the, the flat door. Yeah. Uh, we did find that the rotary done most of the cutting work uh, and the refining work. Okay. One thing I noticed is, bear in mind the, uh, the TVR is carbon fibre, so it's painted yes. carbon fibre. Like a Ferrari F40, if you look at the paint, you yep. can see the texture of the carbon fibre underneath it. Because obviously carbon fibre is about being light, um, and so you don't want to spoil that by putting tons and tons of paint on it. Yes. Um, one thing, you had uh, the big heat gun, so I know we used some of those in the videos, but the idea was not to use too much because of the nature of the carbon fibre, you've got to be a bit more careful using heat. Yeah, so we use uh, infrared thermometers just to keep an eye on the heat because there is a point when it becomes dangerous for the paint, which are around 70 degrees. Mm -hmm. So at 70 degrees centigrade, things like filler can start to reshow. Uh, any repairs that were done to the car can start to come through. But especially on the, the carbon fibre, there's a, a heat point where essentially you could break the bond between the, the paint and the gel coat gotcha. uh, or the, the bare carbon. Uh, so it is, it's one of those cars that takes a lot of uh, experience yeah. and careful use of the, the shortwave infrared lamps. And those lamps are dead clever. The one that um, Craig had wasn't the particular model, but you're bringing in quite soon a new model that has a built-in remote thermometer. So this is something yes. that can monitor surface temperature without touching it, which certainly only with the trader scene because you'll be using on engines and stuff like that, mechanics. Um, but it can then pulse the light to maintain a certain temperature. Any cotton on the market right now, you can cure it at 50 degrees centigrade, okay. uh, and it'll take about weird five to 10 minutes. And that's full cure, so different types of curing, isn't it? So that's full dry. Right. So the curing by any cotton I've ever seen, the curing is done by UV. So what we're doing with the infrared is drying the solvent out, and essentially it's giving it a little boost to cure. But the reason that we use shortwave infrared is that shortwave is the only the only light wave that can pass through the silica yeah. uh, and pass through the clear coat and the paint layer and the primer. It will then reflect off the, the it'll, metal. It'll heat yeah. up the metal or the carbon in this case, and then it will start uh, radiating heat back so out. So you're drying it from the inside out, like, yeah. like, like how a microwave works. Yes. So it's, it's essentially the same way that they would have baked paint before. Uh, modern clear coats are water-based and they tend to use cold drying, uh, so they're not quite the same. So there is a lot of body shops that are now getting rid of their shortwave infrared lamps because it's no longer... Oh, a bit of an opportunity for detailers. To yeah, to so there is, yeah. there is a lot of uh, used body shop equipment places that you can buy them from. Uh, but the shortwave then passes through, heats it from the substrate up. And what happens when you bake a, a coating that way is that if you are air drying the coating, uh, it will cure from the... it will dry from the up to, yeah. the, to the base. So at that point, it will skin over and there will be solvent having to break out. So when you see a, you'll see solvent pop on a clear coat. Yes. So essentially you're getting that with the coating, but because it's so thin, it's not the same. 
Can we just explain what solvent pop so is? So solvent pop is when the the clear coat, it, it can either be the colour coat or the clear coat hasn't been baked properly. So the solvent's trapped underneath, the top layer's skinned over, and in order for the, the solvents to get out, they create a tiny little, it's like a fish eye or like a little yeah. bubble in the paint, and it pops through the surface. And you get another one, sometimes water in the, in the airline and stuff like that, of course. So yeah, uh, that would be, if you get like silicone based fish eyes or water in the airline, it can create a, a it's like a little circle at that point rather than, a uh, solvent pop looks more like someone's hit it with a pin. So it's like someone's been hitting it with a little thumbtack all over uh, and that's that's what the solvent's trying to escape so they have to break through the upper surface. So you essentially get that with the coating but because it's so thin it's not quite as dr drastic so it's, yeah. it's, it's a microscopic scale. But for that solvent to escape it then has to break the bonds that the, the silica particles are forming. So it, it does weaken your coating very slightly. Gotcha. So there's a difference between drying and curing is what you're yeah, saying? So drying is getting rid of the solvent, yep. curing is when the the coating will become solvent resistant, uh, chemical resistant and hard. So that is done by UV, which we did actually develop a UV lamp to fill the cure coating. That'd be kind of cool. Can you imagine a car coming in and once you've coated it, it goes first of all into the uh, uh, into the infrared range yeah. and then you have a presser button in your unit and then suddenly everything goes and tells So the issue with that is that you would have to have a completely closed off room in order to do it because the, the risk of UV rays is extreme. You just have lots so, of very tan details. Yes. So, we did develop the lamp for it, but we very quickly realised in testing that it's just not safe enough to do. So it's, it'll never never make market or anything like that. That's a shame, because you can imagine how effective that would be, because a lot of the problems that we find, um, again with people, because if you've got a, a unit and you can keep the car for a week, then that's grand. Yeah. Uh, but quite a few people, you know, they'll try and do it. I mean, that's why we say you can't do a coating in a day, uh, but even in two days, you know, if you've done all the machining day one, you do the coating maybe the night of day one, and then the customer picks up the following day, that's still not an ideal necessarily, I mean some coatings yeah. are different, but it's, it's ideal really to leave the car quite a decent amount of time. Yeah, so most coatings, as soon as they're dry, they can go back to the customer. Uh, certain coatings like our Seaports UK, we recommend Relo to be put on top while it's curing. Uh, and that just protects it from water spotting and chemicals for, because Seaports UK is going to take about four days. So our approved coatings, the Seaports Professional and Seaports Finest Reserve, they are going to be, become chemical resistant within 24 hours. So with them, you would bake it with the infrared lamp, it's going to dry it, it's then going to sit inside overnight and that's going to give it 12 to 18 hours and by that point it's almost perfectly cured. Yeah. And then the customer's taken away a cured coating anyway, but there is some coatings that do take four to seven days. So most, most people tell their customer not to wash the car either for four days or for a week. And that's just to ensure that the coating has fully cured because if it hasn't and you use chemicals on it, it's yeah. going to thin the layer. So I just want to quietly wrap up here. We've uh, been chatting away. We could talk for hours on this, but uh, nobody would want to listen. Uh, the um, question I've got really is, what is the future for ceramic coatings? What, where are you going to go? Do you think it's going to progress in this kind of linear format where, you know, we start at 6H and now we're on to the, the 8, 9H. It starts at one year guarantee and then we've got people offering seven or nine year guarantees. Is that just going to progress or do you think it's going to hit a, hit a boundary, hit a button? So. I get the feeling that they, there is only going to be so much of a limit that they can put on a, a warranty. So I, I don't know how much further they can push with that. In terms of the H range, there is a, a certain uh, Chinese based website that you can go on and order things direct from manufacturers. On there you will find coatings that claim to be 10, 11, 12 and 13 H. These are, um, now these are the ones that have been reviewed. Are these the very cheap ones that you can get through various online marketplaces? Yes. These, um, we've, we've talked, uh, in fact, again at Car Care, we talked about those because we're looking at MSDS and the safety behind them. Yeah. And um, we, yeah, we have been contacted by the odd person claiming to sort of be able to dish the dirt on all these sort of things. So the, the, the main thing with this, when you're looking at a, cusp, uh, a, a business trying to sell you a 13 inch coating, is that the test for pencil hardness only goes up to 9 inch. Yes. So there's no test for 13 inch. So Slightly it, it's kind of awkward on how you would, uh, how do you know it's 13 H yeah. when you can't possibly test it? Uh, so at this point, it seems to be just a, a one-upmanship of someone's done 10, I'll do 11, someone's done 11, I'll do 12. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the future of coatings, I believe silica is coming to the end of what they can possibly do with a processed natural mineral. So it's all going to go TI, 20, uh, TI. So TiO2 is your titanium dioxide. Yeah. So certain our Seaquartz Professional and our uh, Seaquartz Classic they contain TiO2. So TiO2 is good for boosting the clarity of a coating and it then in turn boosts the gloss. Uh, but in, in my opinion, I can imagine that everyone is going to start moving more towards 
uh, resin hybrids. Okay. So because the epoxy resin silica hybrid that we've got in Seaquartz Finest Reserve, currently it is still the only one that is an epoxy resin hybrid. Uh, and because that's a man-made chemical, there's a lot more possibility for advancement in this area. Yeah. Because as soon as you start building these chemicals, they can then, as technology advances, you can then advance that coating as well. I so see. in the next kind of five to 10 years, I can see silica coatings becoming less and less uh, because it's almost at its kind of peak of where you can take a silica coating. Essentially, everyone's using a, a processed silane resin. Mm -hmm. And then from that, they're adding, they're adding certain solvents, certain things like TiO2, and you're modifying your coating that way. So most silica coatings start with the same base ingredient and then they're made unique by what you add to that. So these cheap offerings could just be that base, that base solution. So what you tend to find in the cheap ones is that they're using the base solution the same as us, but they're using a tiny fraction of it, just enough to call it a silica coating, and then it's mostly solvent. Uh, so I think there was one that's around nine, 10 pounds. Yes. And they found out when they started looking into it that it's about 97% solvent. Yes, we have quite a lot of people complaining about uh, from a personal set, you know, getting headaches and stuff because yeah. solvents are so strong. So that's the other issue is that in, in certain areas of Asia, it, you have to wonder whether they're following the, the proper safety. And, yeah. uh, so that, that is a worry. There was one of our products when the laws changed in Japan, they had to change the carrier agent because it became, the Japanese decided it wasn't safe anymore. Yeah. Uh, so things like that you have to keep in in mind when you're dealing with products, go for big name companies that are doing the proper testing. Gotcha. Uh, okay, so moving away from the ceramic side, uh, is there anything new and exciting on the horizon at CarPro the next 12 months? Uh, so we are constantly developing new products. At the moment, we're, we're focusing on uh, the maintenance range as well, bringing in a few more products that fill in the gaps in our maintenance range. So at the moment, we've got things like shampoo, filter removers, tar removers and stuff, but we don't have snow foams, pre-wash, uh, we recently brought out uh, a bug remover yes. because it was something that customers were always asking for is they wanted something that's coating safe to use on bugs because quite often people use degreasers or other bug removers. Well, bugs are actually, I mean bug removal is quite a specific thing isn't it? Yes. Is that they're acidic or there's something quite specific about it? So the issue when a, a bug hits a car is that depending on what bug it is there'll be varying levels of pH from the, their bodily fluids so it splatters on your car it can quite quickly start to eat into the coating or the paintwork if yeah. it's uncoated. Uh, so quite often you'll see uh, cars that don't have any protection and you'll see that even when you remove the bugs there's an acid mark left. Yeah. So the quicker you can get that off the better. Uh, the other issue with bugs is that obviously they have a, a sort of exoskeleton. So you can't just wipe them away, you have to dissolve it first. Because if you just wash over it with your wash mitt and your shampoo, you'll be grinding that into the surface. So ideally what you want is something that can safely dissolve the, the bug and make it run off and, and just run away. Bits, all the legs, all the yeah. stingers, all the, all the gooey bits. I mean, a big hornet has got quite a lot to it, I have to admit. Yes. Uh, the other issue with bugs is that when your paint heats up in the sun, it'll start to expand. Uh, so if the bugs, typically they're on kind of lower areas, but any, the, the issue that we normally see with bird droppings as well, is that when the paint expands, it's then got the weight of the bird dropping pushing that area down. Yeah. So sometimes when it contracts around the bird etching, you then end up with a, a slightly lower level of clear clear. Coat. Yeah, that's what uh, John Hogg was talking about. Yeah, when you're doing mega so testing, yeah. it does. It then affects the clear coat, so that when the the bird etching is removed, the clear coat's sitting lower in that area. So traditionally, you can either polish it off, and you'll have to reduce all the clear coat to that level. Uh, you can you can get them out with heat, but you need to know the technique yes because you don't well, that's reflow really for purpose isn't it yes Either. yes so essentially by that you're just trying to swell the paint and make it re-level or one level you do still typically have to polish a little bit out at the end of that because you will get the acid etching from whatever the bird's been eating the other issue with bird droppings is that uh, they tend to eat gravel for digestion right uh, so when the bird dropping hits your car it's, it has stones in it as well that's not very nice. so yeah. for that we released eco 2 which is a waterless wash concentrate. So we, we recommend all our coated cars keep a, a, one of our boas and some Eco2 and also some tissue paper. So with the, what we, what we recommend is you place the tissue paper on, spray the Eco2 onto Saturate that, the tissue, yeah. and that way it can sit on for a couple of minutes and soften it. Because if you just spray it on and wipe it straight away, you'll wipe the gravel onto it and all the, the dried bird dropping. Uh, so spray that on, sit it on for a few minutes, 
carefully lift away the tissue paper and then wipe it, spray some more on, wipe it with the boa. Yeah. And that way you can safely safe remove bird droppings without having to wait until you're washing the car. Gotcha. And a boa, by the way, is a microfiber bit yeah, that so is made by CarPro. Yeah, um, so it's a, one of our thick, plush microfibers. Gotcha. So we've learned many things here today. We've learned that uh, with ceramic coatings, they have a limited time scale in their, in their current form, and that they'll probably all be following the route that the uh, the Seacourt's finest reserve. reserve currently does. Uh, we've learned that insects eat gravel to aid uh, birds. their birds do, not insects. I was about to say this. <laughs> It's, it's illness. Um, so birds eat gravel to aid their digestion. Uh, we've learnt um, that you can reflow the lacquer in certain circumstances when it comes to uh, re-leveling lacquer after bird mess uh, and etching. Uh, so there's an awful lot going on. Craig, it's been an absolute pleasure. You are a fountain of knowledge and a gentleman to boost. Um, it has been a pleasure having you here. And you, um, this TVR, we shall be putting shots on that soon. It looks absolutely stunning. Yeah, it's um, looking good. And I believe the whole point of doing this partially is uh, partly to get Nick Fisher excited, but, but mostly to create a um, promotional video for uh, CarPro. And I think it's going to be pretty stunning. We've had a drone here. We've had all sorts of other things. Yeah, so uh, this is our first UK-based promo. So the guys in USA have been taking all the all the, the glory for the last few years. They've got beautiful videos. If you search for things like Seaquarts Finest Pagani or Seaquarts Finest 488. And we've got uh, the TVR. And now we've got the, the TVR Speed 12. So the only thing we've got that they don't is it's one of one in the world. It is, it is. That's, that's, that's something I suppose. Um, <laughs> I think the AA man's going to be arriving soon. So we've got to dive off to that. But uh, thank you very much for watching and we'll catch up soon. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Craig Hall of CarPro UK when we were up in York at Max Car Care with a certain sexy TVR Cerberus B12 race car. Um, if you would like to watch more, uh, you can watch part two here. And if you would like to subscribe, click here.